The lectionary lesson that Megan just read so well can seem almost as strange as some of the images we covered last week from the book of Revelation. If you read the whole Cornelius story in Acts 10 and 11, it becomes a, a bit clearer. Peter is defending the inclusion of Gentiles in the church. Gentiles were thought by some church leaders to be profane and unclean. Peter had recently baptized Cornelius, an enemy Roman centurion, and his Gentile family and friends. And the church leaders are, are calling Peter to task for allowing access to Jesus' way to those of the culture considered profane and unclean. Uh, the name Cornelius always makes me think of the musical Hello Dolly, because I was once in it as Cornelius, a hapless store clerk who dragged his assistant Barnaby on a tour of New York. And at one point in our production as Cornelius, I, I hurdled a huge table that I might have trouble just crawling under today. The Bible's Cornelius cleared a hurdle to a huge exclusion that was going on to Jesus' table. As a Gentile, he and his family were considered culturally profane and unclean by many in the early church because, as the lesson includes, among other things, their tablecloths had unkosher food on them. The author of Acts he is, is instructing us that God made sure such hurdles were removed. Just a few verses before our lesson in Acts 10, 29, Peter sums it all up, disclosing that, quote, God has shown me that I should not call anyone profane or unclean. I've rarely heard that commandment by God stated in a church, and I've never heard it referred to by those who claim that this person or that is profane or unclean. It's not on any buildings or statues that I know of, or even in a hymn. But it should be on every Christian's heart and mind when religious leaders or anyone else calls or suggests that someone is profane or unclean. Most hurdles to the church and care to others would come tumbling down if that one little known biblical commandment followed by Christians and on our tongues when any discriminatory hurdle is raised by a church, a church member, or a church leader. God has shown that I should call, I should not call anyone profane or unclean is the perfect defense and antidote to Christian bullying, discrimination, and hate toward others, especially if it is followed up by noting Jesus commands us to love our neighbor and that no command, no command can outrank his direction to love. If we didn't call anyone profane or unclean, if we loved all our neighbors, then how if we let them know that God loves them too, then every Gentile, Jew, young, old, poor, rich, straight, LGBTQ, red, yellow, black, and white, everyone would know that they are not profane or unclean or a lot, but are precious in God's sight. And that's what Peter and thankfully the church basically decide in the reading today. Gentiles are allowed in because, as we heard, a voice from heaven declared what God has made clean. You must not call profane. And that's a message not just about food. It's about people, too. Along and the short of it is that God's idea about who gets God's love and is welcome in the church is everywhere. It should not be a surprise if Genesis instructs humans are made in God's image and that God declared humans and for that matter all of creation good. And no one can undo that, try as they might. You see, all are precious in God's sight. And all are supposed to be precious in our sight. Young adults and children in this 
community, as they move through life in general, will no doubt experience hurdles. We all do. Life is full of challenges to lead, climb, or otherwise get around. And that's not in and of itself a bad thing. But the challenge, the hurdle that no one should encounter, let alone put up or not actually work to take down, is the hurdle that denies a person's worthiness of God's love, including limiting the love provided by a church and limiting our own personal Christian care, compassion, and the desire for others' well-being. I say this every week. And I want all the youth and the children to especially hear it this morning. You are love and you matter much. I end every worship service with those words because it's always true. No matter what, forever. And that means every single person in this room. And I emphasize it on Recognition Sunday because hurdles to care and compassion and love these days seem to especially exist. There is a bitter divisiveness in our culture that has many not caring and not offering love to others. Out there in the world, in new classrooms and schools, in new places, with new people, there's a good chance that hurdles real and imagined will be put up to attempt to exclude people, maybe even some of us, from care, from compassion, from love. And sad. Sometimes it happens in church, in the name of Jesus. And that is wrong. But it's not new. It was happening at the time of our text that we heard Megan read. People born of another race and another faith were denied a place in Jesus' following unless they denied who they were, underwent painful circumcisions, made drastic dietary changes, and followed other strains to them, cleanliness and purity rules. These were cultural hurts that denied all Gentiles access to Jesus' way, a way that Jesus himself opened up to everyone with no such hurdles in place. Jesus had centurions. He had Gentiles in his community. He had no condition to love to his table. And Jesus' way of unconditional love was very biblical even before the New Testament existed. The Hebrew scriptures in a number of places claimed in no uncertain terms that God's love is steadfast and it endures forever. It's a main theme in Jesus' teaching. It can be found out in both the New and the Old Testament. And what it means is that we're in love and we cannot lose that love. It means that you are loved by God and you cannot lose that love. It means that there are no hurdles to God's love for us or anyone else. Even those others claim are unclean or profane. No matter what any human says or writes, they cannot alter the fact that each and every human being is loved. All are loved by God and Jesus and all matter much. This means all of us here today, and all are supposed to be loved by us as Jesus' followers, too. That's pretty radical because there have always been lots of hurdles to human love. And all those of you who are the beloved children and youth in this family of Christ, as you move on in life, the one thing above all else that I hope you know and never forget one thing I want everyone in this worship service to know and never forget is that there is no hurt to love by God or to love here in this church community. There's nothing you want. There's nothing you can become and nothing you can do or say that will cause God's love, Jesus' love, our love, or my love from ending. It is steadfast and forever, even if, as our closing hymn puts it, we wander off and find where demons dwell. If demon finding does not end God's love, nothing can, nothing. And if we strive in this church to make sure nothing ends our love either, we do that. If we do it successfully, you can always come. I know that you
more love no matter what to us. And I hope our young adults and children and everyone else here never forgets that. We must also not forget that being loved ourselves is not the end. We are to love God in all creation, including especially every human being, even enemies like Cornelius was to Peter and the early church. Love is an action we must take, and often that action is to work, to take down hurdles. The Jesus movement begins in Luke, the prequel to Acts, with Jesus declaring he came to proclaim release of the captives and to let the oppressed go free. Jesus was not afraid to proclaim his no hurdles to love theology. And thankfully, neither is the United Church of Christ. The UCC banner in front of our church this week proclaims the essence of this no hurdles to love theology. The banner, if you didn't see it, reads quite simply, Jesus didn't reject people. And then it adds, neither do we. And that last bit's out putting Jesus' way into action. A promise of not being inactive like those who let rejecting of others go on. We affirmatively reject rejecting others. Jesus didn't reject them. Neither do we. Why is that better up in UCC churches or many UCC churches? Because a lot of churches do reject people and people are injured by it and many leaving churches many are leaving churches are not coming to them because of those rejections and so we have to take action we have to boldly set ourselves apart from those who speak and, and act against jesus way of all inclusive love we have to stand up for that inclusive love and proclaim it loud on the street corner and in the pulpit and then act it out together as churches and on our own as christians Put it in the words of Micah 6, up on the church wall, we are to seek justice, to love kindness. Another UCC slogan is, wherever you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. Now, last week, our banner proclaimed it like this, God's love has no strings attached. Simply put in this church, we want no hurdles to love because Jesus had no hurdles to love. God has no hurdles. It's the very core of Jesus' way and this church's way. At this church, we glom on to what Jesus glom on to, the belief that God is love, that caring, having compassion, and the desire for well-being is our call. We aim to love and welcome all as Christ does, as God does, unconditionally. And the importance of making sure we let folks know God, Jesus, and we love them cannot be stressed enough. See, the actor who played Barnaby and Hello Dolly with me, I first met at a church when we were teens in the 70s. He was gay. And the church was not gay friendly. The church had hurdles to love, not friends. Jazz, a few years later, intentionally overdosed. His life ended. And I believe a loving church proclaiming God's in word and deed would have made all oh, the difference to Jeff. Huge hurdles. To Jeff's sense of being fully loved by God, Jesus, the congregation, and his pastor were wrongfully and sinfully put up and not taken down. Hurdles to church matter. Hurdles to love matter. Hurdles to church are exactly what are at issue in the lectionary lesson today. Peter understood God to command there are to be no hurt. And so he boldly and passionately took action to take them down and as a consequence an enemy soldier and his Gentile family and friends were welcome and loved and Gentiles like most of us have been welcomed in church ever since. Here's the good news. The good news is that all of us need to leave here knowing, most especially our children and, and youth. You are, and you always will be, loved and matter much. That's true about God. That's true about Jesus. That's true about the church. That's true about me. 
champion. Ever be someone.